Hello, and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Program, New Frontiers in Research and Care. I'm Melody McLaughlin, Senior Community Program Manager for the New England Chapter of the Parkinson's Foundation. And I am so thrilled to be joining you today for this special program featuring speakers from one of our local centers of excellence, Massachusetts General Hospital. For those of you who are new to the Parkinson's Foundation, welcome. We are the nation's leading community for people with Parkinson's disease, the people who love them, and all of those who are working to end the disease. With our presence in communities across the country and the globe, we believe in the promise of a cure and a better life today for those impacted by PD. Hmm. The urgency of our mission really translates into what we do. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals, ensuring better care for everyone today, understanding Parkinson's through research for tomorrow, and educating and empowering the Parkinson's community for us all. We provide free resources, including our website, parkinson.org, educational book series, webinars, podcasts, our hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, our newly diagnosed kit, and of course, our toll-free helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, which is staffed by Parkinson's specialists. On the research front, we invest more than $10 million annually to study Parkinson's, what causes it, how to treat it, and ultimately how to cure it. I'd like to highlight PD Generation, which is an initiative that offers genetic testing and genetic counseling at no cost for people with Parkinson's. After a successful pilot program, we are thrilled to announce that PD Gene has launched its next step, a genetic test that can be completed at home. Dr. Wills will be speaking more about this initiative, so stay tuned for that. To learn more, visit parkinson.org slash PD Generation. So how are we connecting with our communities? Your being here with us today is a prime example of that. It's really through our centers of excellence, including Mass General, local PD experts like those joining us today, volunteers, advocates, and staff across the country that we bring people together to educate and empower those impacted by moving day, by PD. And speaking of moving day, we also connect with our Parkinson's communities through our nationwide moving day events. Since 2011, our moving day walks have raised more than $27 million to support research, our centers of excellence network, and provide educational resources and programs across the country. We are very excited to share with you all that we are bringing moving day to New Hampshire on May 22nd, 2021. To learn more about our New Hampshire moving day, please visit movingdaywalk.org. And always looking for ways to keep the PD community connected, the Parkinson's Foundation has been providing weekly educational and wellness programs in a virtual format through our PD Health at Home series. PD Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation, whose generosity has made this programming possible so that you can join for Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, or Fitness Fridays by visiting parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Today's program was made possible by the support of our sponsors. Today, we thank our platinum sponsor, Synovian, our silver sponsor, Kiowa Kieran, and our bronze sponsors, Acadia, Accorda Therapeutics, Amnil Phar Pharmaceuticals, Boston Scientific, Lundbeck, Medtronic, Supernus Pharmaceuticals. We invite you to learn about our program sponsors by visiting our virtual exhibit hall at parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter supporters. And before we kick off today's program, let's hear a few words from our platinum sponsor, Synovian. People with Parkinson's need new ideas, little ideas, big ideas, ideas that may even change lives. And that's why we created Little Big Things, an innovation platform for people with Parkinson's, care partners, doctors, innovators, and more. Join us, and together, let's spark, share, and celebrate the little big things happening in Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Synovian, for your support. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Albert Hung. Dr. Hung is a specialist in the diagnosis and treatment of Parkinson's disease, tremor, and other movement disorders. 
He completed his MD and PhD degrees at Harvard Medical School and then received training in neurology and movement disorders in the Partners Neurology Program of Mass General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Hung is the Medical Director of the Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence at MGH and the Associate Director of the Movement Disorders Unit. He is also a member of the Parkinson's Study Group and participates in clinical research trials to identify and develop new treatments for Parkinson's disease. Dr. Hong, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Melody and uh, the Parkinson's Foundation, it's a pleasure to uh, participate in this program and have a chance to uh, discuss an area that's really important uh, in Parkinson's disease and in particular to our Center of Excellence at Mass General. Uh, the topic of uh, today's talk is really how we bridge the research aspects of Parkinson's disease with clinical care. I don't have any relevant conflicts of interest related to this, but I am the center director of the uh, COE at Mass General that's sponsored by the Parkinson's Foundation. Over the last 20 years, we have come to understand a lot more about what causes Parkinson's disease. And obviously that understanding is really critical to be able to develop new treatments and hopefully ultimately to come up with a cure. Uh, we recognize now that there are multiple factors that place a person at risk for developing Parkinson's during their lifetime. There are genetic factors, which you'll hear a lot more about from Dr. Wills uh, later on today, but there's also environmental factors. And those two groups of factors conspire in a particular person to cause a change in a protein called alpha-synuclein. We understand now that alpha-synuclein plays really a critical role in the development of Parkinson's disease by forming abnormal aggregates that clump within um, neuronal cells. Uh, this slide here shows what is referred to as a Lewy body. And this pink aggregate of protein forms within healthy neurons and causes them to be dysfunctional. Uh, this process can occur in a large number of different neuronal cell types, but one of the cell types that's most relevant to Parkinson's and its symptoms is the formation of these Lewy bodies within dopamine neurons. When dopaminergic cells in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra are affected by Lewy bodies, it causes these cells to die. It causes the connections that they make, the synapses with other neighboring cells uh, to become dysfunctional. And that uh, pathway, when it's affected, leads to many of the symptoms that we identify as being the diagnostic features of Parkinson's disease. Symptoms like tremor, stiffness, slowness, or problems with walking and balance. The other thing that we understand about Parkinson's now is that those symptoms that allow us to make the diagnosis, the movement symptoms, are really just the tip of the iceberg. And below the surface, many people are experiencing non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease that can oftentimes be as debilitating or affect a person's quality of life as much if not more than some of the motor symptoms. When you go to a meeting for movement disorder specialists or for Parkinson's specialists, you have the lab guys, the people who are talking about research and what we need to understand in order to be able to come up with a cure. And their language talks about genes and talks about alpha-synuclein and Lewy bodies and dopamine and synaptic dysfunction. But as a clinician, that is not what we hear in the clinic. The people in the clinic don't talk about alpha-synuclein and Lewy bodies. They talk about tremor, about stooped posture, about medicines, about exercise, about whether or not they may or may not be a candidate for deep brain stimulation. And so even though we're talking about the same disease, we're using different language. And what we have to do is we have to figure out how to connect the two. We have to figure out how to take advances in the lab and bring them into the clinic. And we have to take what we understand from patients in the clinic and bring that back to the lab. And that's really the focus of today's talk. So I wanna step back for a moment and um, have you think a little bit about how researchers model and think about Parkinson's disease. When you go into a lab, really, you have to figure out a simplified mechanism, a simplified model in, utter, in order to be able to understand complex disease. And so a basic scientist are trying to come up with animal or cell-based models of Parkinson's disease, which they can perturb and change in a controlled way to see what kind of effect it has. On the other side, 
Parkinson's disease is not a disease of rodents or of other primates. Parkinson's disease is uniquely a disease that affects humans. And so we have to use what we learn from patients in order to guide how we model research in the lab. So again, you're gonna hear a lot more later on about genetics, but as we've come to learn more about how specific genetic factors influence Parkinson's disease, you can make changes in those genes put them into animal or cell-based models, and that gives you a more powerful research uh, system to be able to study how Parkinson's comes about. The other way that we can learn about Parkinson's from humans is to think about epidemiology. This is basically the area of science that uh, allows us to identify specific risk factors, lifestyle factors, and uh, try and understand how those might put a person at greater risk for developing one disease or another, in our case, Parkinson's disease. So in the case of Parkinson's, we know that there are certain risk factors that heighten the risk of a person developing PD. For example, exposures to pesticides and heavy metals. We also know that there are certain lifestyle factors, smoking, not encouraging anybody to go out and smoke, but smoking and caffeine do have protective effects and people who have a history of smoking or significant caffeine use earlier in life may be at a lower risk to develop Parkinson's disease. And so these types of uh, research models communicate one with the other. They help inform how to develop better ways to study Parkinson's. And ultimately, when all of that information comes together, it allows us to design clinical trials where we take our preclinical and our research information and bring it to the clinic. Ultimately, the goal of Parkinson's research is to find a cure. And it's worthwhile to think a little bit about why that has been so challenging, despite the fact that we know so much more now than we did 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. One of the challenges is that the changes in the brain start well before any symptoms appear and they occur very gradually over time. So by the time I see somebody in the clinic for the first time with tremor or stiffness or the symptoms that allow us to diagnose Parkinson's disease, there's good evidence from pathology that by that point, about 75% of those dopamine producing neurons have already been lost. So by the time we recognize that somebody has PD, we're already behind the eight ball in terms of trying to slow it down. Another challenge is that there's no proven tests or biomarkers available to follow the progression of Parkinson's disease. And so designing any kind of trial becomes tricky because if you don't have a specific way to monitor the disease progression, uh, you rely more on surrogate markers like a clinical exam. But you know, if we had something like the diabetes field has when they follow blood sugar or hemoglobin A1C, or the cancer field has when they can follow uh, CAT scans or MRIs to look for disease progression. We would have a powerful tool that would allow us to um, make our clinical trials more successful. The other important question is to think again about how closely the animals' uh, models resemble human PD. There have been many trials that have been designed based on very, very strong preclinical evidence in the lab. And then when we bring them into the clinic, they turn out not to have the same success that we would hope for. So as we're thinking about bridging research and clinical care, I wanna give you three examples. The first example is the case of levodopa. For those of you who are on Parkinson's medicines or have talked to your doctors about Parkinson's medications, one of the things that you know is that even though we don't have medicines to slow down PD, we do have medications to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's and levodopa is the best one. So turning the clock back, if we go back into the 1950s, this was the first time we realized that dopamine played any role in Parkinson's disease. Arvid Carlson did some experiments in the lab and found that a drug called reserpine blocked brain dopamine and that if you gave levodopa, which is a precursor for dopamine, you could bring those levels back up. It was a few years later that um, Hornikevich identified the loss of dopamine in the striatum as being a major neurochemical alteration. And that's really how the dopamine re uh, revolution in Parkinson's started. About seven years later, George Coetzeeus gave levodopa to some Parkinson's patients and found that it improved motor symptoms, 
And then a couple of years later, Oliver Sacks um, showed that patients who had a post-encephalitic form of Parkinsonism uh, responded well to high levels of uh, high doses of levodopa. This is the story that um, was uh, made into a movie, Awakenings. So all of that information in the lab and in research studies came together to the point that carbidopa levodopa was approved by the FDA in 1975. So what it goes to show is that, you know, if we go back a couple of generations, we had no treatments for Parkinson's disease. And so even though we talk now about carbidopa and levodopa as being things that we readily treat, used to treat Parkinson's, it's important to remember that that drug only became available because of research. Another example is alpha-synuclein. Uh, over the last 20 years, we have come to understand a lot more about alpha-synuclein. We know that mutations in this one particular gene can cause rare familial cases of Parkinson's disease. And we also know that alpha-synuclein is the main protein component of Lewy bodies. What's interesting is within the last 10 years or so, there's been increasing evidence to suggest that alpha-synuclein can spread from one brain cell to another. And this might actually be one of the mechanisms by which Parkinson's progresses. So we take that information that we first learned from people identifying these families with Parkinson's, took it into the lab, understood how alpha-synuclein works and doesn't work. And now we're taking it back into the clinic again uh, with the launch of the first human trials using antibodies that target alpha-synuclein. So this is really an example of the back and forth crosstalk between the lab and the clinic. Another interesting example is the case of exercise. So when you use epidemiology to look at the relationship between exercise and Parkinson's disease, most, not all, but most epidemiologic studies demonstrate an inverse relation between physical activity and Parkinson's disease. So that those people who were physically active earlier in life seem to have a lower risk of developing Parkinson's later. When you take that into the lab and look to see how forced exercise affects um, the development of Parkinson's in these animal models, we've learned that exercise enhances neuroplasticity, it increases the levels of growth factors, and it can reduce neuronal cell loss in Parkinson's animal models. So it suggests that exercise may actually be one way of slowing down the disease. We've also learned a lot about the role of exercise from large human cohorts like the Parkinson's Outcome Project, which is one of the main uh, research programs that is uh, directed by the Parkinson's Foundation. When you look at large numbers of people and just try to ask them questions about how much they exercise and you follow them over time, regular exercise is associated with better motor outcomes, cognitive performance, and quality of life. So now we've taken all of that information that we've learned and now are bringing it back into the clinic. And now there are some randomized clinical trials for exercise that are currently ongoing and recruiting. So here's one question I'd have for you. What has your role been in terms of participating in Parkinson's research? Have you participated in more than one study, one study, considered it, or never done that? Why don't you go ahead and take a moment and answer the question. All right, so this is, we've got a good sampling here. So, you know, what's interesting is that all of you are on this um, uh, webinar because you're interested in research, yet 42% of you have never been approached or considered participating in a study. Uh, we've got a third who have participated in one study, and then the rest are kind of divided evenly between those who have done more than one study or those who considered. So um, of the uh, group that we've got here, uh, not quite a half have participated in some research study. So why should we, why should you think about participating in clinical research? I think that some of these um, should be obvious.
Hello, everyone. We're waiting for Dr. Hung to rejoin us, and you may see a polling question appear on your screen soon. And while we're waiting, oh, here we go. What are your favorite things about learning online in this new virtual world we're in? And again, while we're waiting for Dr. Hung to rejoin, feel free to answer this poll. What are some of your favorite things about learning virtually online? I'm seeing the results tick in, don't be shy. Let's get to 50% of people to participate. Awesome, thank you all. So it looks like hearing from speakers you wouldn't normally get to hear from. That's wonderful is the majority of people um, who are enjoying this sort of virtual experience, getting to hear from folks maybe they wouldn't otherwise be able to learn from. And I think we do have Dr. Hung has rejoined us. Dr. Hung, are you able to hear us? I think you're on mute right now. Uh, I, can you hear me now? You're back. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No worries. I think it's because you're in the frozen tundra over there. Uh, maybe that is it. So I apologize for that. I think I'm back now. All right. So, um, I mean, I was talking a little bit about why participate in clinical research. You know, the important thing to know is that obviously the more we know about Parkinson's, the better we can treat it. Every new test, every new drug requires human volunteers. You know, the FDA really requires people to participate in research in order to be able to bring new drugs to the market. Um, in some cases, a person who chooses to participate in a research study might have an opportunity to get exposure to a new potentially effective drug years before the approval. And then obviously participation is really critical in order to help others with Parkinson's in the future. So when you're thinking about research studies, there are a type of different studies. One type of study are observational studies. These are studies where people are uh, monitored over a longer period of time they're tracked for their outcomes, and it allows research to identify how different factors affect disease progression. There's other clinical research studies that are clinical trials or interventional studies. And in these cases, people are exposed to different types of treatments. They may be medicines, they may be different exercise regimens, but here the intervention is followed closely according to a defined protocol, and the goal is to determine whether those interventions are safe or effective. One big area of Parkinson's, as I alluded to before, is the need for biomarkers. The definition of a biomarker is an objective indicator of a particular disease state. And currently we have no available biomarkers to confirm Parkinson's disease diagnosis or to follow progression. If we did have a biomarker, it would potentially facilitate earlier diagnosis and treatment. And again, biomarkers would also allow for more reliable monitoring of disease progression in clinical trials. So there are different studies that are using ways to follow people over time. Some biomarker studies will ask for blood donations or spinal fluid or maybe doing skin biopsies. There's also other types of ways to monitor um, disease progression and look at outcomes. And again, this Parkinson's Outcomes Project that I mentioned is one way to do that. Uh, the POP is the largest ever clinical study of Parkinson's disease. Uh, over 13,000 people have enrolled, um, and uh, 9,000 of which are in the United States. And in these studies, people who are agreeing to participate will provide information about uh, their exercise, about their medications, about whether they've had falls, uh, which um, Parkinson's center they follow, and you're able to track them over time, and it will allow us to figure out which interventions may affect that progression or outcome. And it also allows us to uh, find ways to improve care. So these types of studies are really critical in, in, uh, in 
uh, fueling our understanding and our clinical care in ways that don't involve going into the lab. Of course, one of the big areas of research is to try to find medicines that slow down Parkinson's or modify the overall course of the disease. These are some of the ways that um, uh, clinical research are trying to find uh, in order to try to slow down PD progression. Uh, one approach is using drugs that have been approved for other conditions and repurposing them for Parkinson's disease. Uh, another set of studies targets alpha-synuclein directly. And the last one, which you'll hear about more in just a moment, uh, uh, targets genetic um, uh, it, uh, contributors to Parkinson's disease. Now, sadly, within the last year, some of these we have to remove from the list because they've already been studied and not been proven to be effective. But the way I would look at this is that while those studies are disappointing, it doesn't highlight the progress that's being made. And hopefully one of these areas of research will bring a drug to market in the coming years that will um, be a proven way to slow down PD. One other uh, type of research study that involves medications is um, ways to try and reduce complications of Parkinson's disease. So the TOPAS study highlighted here is a uh, research trial that's funded by the Parkinson's Foundation with the goal to see whether or not we can reduce fractures in people with PD. So as all of you know, as Parkinson's progresses, people are at greater risk for developing balance problems and falls. And with each of those falls, there's a risk of breaking a hip or fracturing another bone. So this particular study, the Topaz study, is um, looking for 3,500 men and women with Parkinson's disease to see whether or not they would agree to be randomized to an FDA-approved treatment for osteoporosis called zoledronic acid. Uh, it is a home-based study. There's no clinic visits. And if it's something that you're interested in, you can go to the Parkinson's Foundation website to find out more. So how do you find out about clinical trials? I would say, talk to your neurologist. There is also an online website, www.clinicaltrials.gov, which is sponsored by the NIH. I did a, uh, a quick screen of that uh, this week in preparing for this talk. And there are 475 studies that are currently recruiting for Parkinson's in the US and North America and around the world. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of participating in clinical trials? Some of the advantages are that you can get access to new treatment. Another advantage is that you may have more access to your physician than you do in the clinical sense. So most of these studies require more frequent visits to ensure safety, to be able to monitor symptoms. And so uh, for some people, maybe more so in a pre-COVID era, that was a real advantage. Uh, you may get access to some medications at lower cost. And ultimately, there's an altruistic role to participating in research where you know that you're helping others with Parkinson's disease. Some of the disadvantages are that you may get exposed to a treatment that where we don't necessarily know the risks or the side effects. Um, most studies are randomized and placebo controlled. And obviously, the reason we're doing the research is because you don't know for sure whether or not the treatment will be beneficial to you. So here's one other poll question. As you're thinking about your role in research participation, what are some of the reservations you have? Some people might say, well, you know, I don't really want a medication or a treatment that other people have not yet tried. I don't want to be a guinea pig. Some people don't want to be in a study where they might end up on a placebo. Maybe uh, time or in the case of COVID coming to the office is um, too burdensome to participate in a research study or all of the above. So why don't you go ahead and answer that question? All right, so we've got an interesting breakdown. 58% um, of the people said uh, they don't wanna be a guinea pig. 45% um, don't wanna be on a placebo. Uh, about a quarter of people say it takes too much time. Uh, I didn't see all of the above, but my guess is that given all of these uh, add up to more than 100%, um, probably some people answered more than one. So, I wanna close this um, talk just by saying that clinical trials needs you. The Parkinson's community needs you, we need you. 
despite lots of good ideas and lots of good science, 30% of all clinical trials fail to recruit a single person to participate in the study. Almost all studies face delays due to limited participation. And so while everybody on this webinar wants to get medications and treatments that are going to slow down Parkinson's as quickly as possible, it's important to realize that unless we have people who are willing to participate in research, we're not going to achieve that goal. And then fewer than 10% of Parkinson's patients ever take part in trials. So it's great here, we've got a larger number of that. But even though everybody would say they wanna work with scientists to help speed treatment breakthroughs, only a very small number ever actually participate in research. So just to summarize, you know, basic and clinical research studies are critical to improving our understanding of Parkinson's, designing better treatments and ultimately curing Parkinson's. I hope I've made an argument for you why research and the clinic have to talk to one, uh, one another, and only by doing that are we going to get the advances that we're all looking for. Uh, difficulty in recruiting volunteers slows down progress in research and drug development. So, you know, as you're thinking about what your role is and as you're listening to this talk, consider participating in clinical research. It's not for everybody, and for those of you who it's really not right for, that's fine, but give it some thought. Talk to your neurologist about it. Thanks very much for your attention. I apologize for the technical issues. Great, and thank you, Dr. Hong, for the, laying this excellent foundation for us and our audience. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anne-Marie Wills, who'll share more on the genetics of Parkinson's disease. Anne-Marie is a neurologist specializing in neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's, PSP, and ALS. She received her BA from Princeton University, her MD from Columbia College Physicians and Surgeons, and her MPH from Harvard School of Public Health. She completed her specialty training in the Partners Neurology Residency Program and has been on staff at MGH since 2006. She's on the steering committee of the PD Generation Study, is the former co-director of the Genes and Environment Working Group of the PSG, co-founder of the Atypical Parkinsonian Disorders Working Group of the PSG, and is the PI of several clinical trials in Parkinson's disease and PSP. Dr. Wills' research focuses on environmental <clears throat> and genetic risk factors and determinants of disease progression in Parkinson's disease and PSP. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wills. Thank you, Melody. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. And... Can everybody see that? Okay, so um, I'm gonna um, start uh, somewhat uh, from the point of view of the genetics of um, Parkinson's disease. Albert already gave a background introduction um, about uh, the, some, of the, some of the genetic discoveries um, and how they've translated into um, therapies or, or clinical trials, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into, into the genetics now. Um, these are my disclosures. I am a steering committee member for the PD Generation study, um, and we are participating as a site in that study. Um, I've also participated in, um, or we are participating in a clinical trial sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme um, targeting GBAPD. Um, so those are sort of my relevant disclosures. Um, Albert already showed the, 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 uh, a slide that was similar to this talking about how um, we think that the, the etiology of Parkinson's disease is really a combination of both genetics and environmental risk factors. So um, we, we uh, think that people who have a positive family history um, are about 20% of our population. Um, so they obviously have a, a genetic component, um, but there are also people who don't have a known uh, family history who do have some underlying genetic risk. And we think that the combination of that genetic risk with an environmental risk factor, such as pesticides. Albert mentioned well water as another, as another source of pesticides or head trauma, or now interestingly, um, some of the encephalitides or some of the uh, infectious uh, agents, um, that those things coming together could produce Parkinson's disease. 
So we're going to talk in more depth today about the Parkinson's genes um, and the, how they are um, leading to potential therapies. So um, as I mentioned, maybe up to 20% of people will have a strong family history. Um, about 10 to 15% of people we think to have um, a clear uh, single gene that could be the cause of the disease. And about 30% of people who have a probable single gene are identified when we do these types of um, sequencing studies, when we actually test for the known Parkinson's genes. So there are actually a lot of genes out there that we still haven't identified, even though about 25 genes have been identified to date, a large number of them are still unknown. Um, just to, to sort of do a, a basic um, recap of, um, of genetics, um, so I like to think of genes as sort of like the instruction manual for your body. They, they tell your body what proteins to make, how to make a cell, how to make a tissue, and in the end, how to make you. Um, so here's an example, eye color. There's, a, there's a, one particular gene that actually could, determines eye color. And it's, it's, a, it's a very simple um, uh, way of just being translated into a protein and it, that goes into the, the, the color of your eye. Um, in the same way, individual slight variants in different genes are what make us tall or short or, or have dark hair or light hair, all those types of, of traits are expressed by your genes and your instruction manual. Um, DNA is sort of like the individual words in that instruction manual. So here's an example of a, of a DNA sequence of, a, of, a, of one gene, and you can see it's just a string of these letters, A, T, C, G, and it just goes over and over and over the same letters. Um, and those letters then get translated into proteins, and then those proteins get translated into cells. You have 3.2 billion DNA base pairs, and um, about 3 million of those are unique to you. And so that is where people talk about, you know, your DNA being your fingerprint, that this is, this is what is special about you. And this is how we can tell people apart based on their DNA, based on the individual small differences in this type of a string of letters. So here's an example. If you have what we call a coding mutation, so this is if your gene at the top here has one slight difference, one single nucleotide difference. Here I've highlighted it in yellow. Um, if, it's a, if, it's, if it's the right kind of difference, it can actually change the sequence of the protein that is being coded by that gene. And that change in the protein could actually make a big difference in how the protein functions, how it folds. Here you can see a misfolded protein because of one tiny genetic mutation. So, so this, is, this is how most mutations lead to disease. However, mutations don't always cause disease. There's something called penetrance. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is the fact that you have two copies of every gene, one from your mother, one from your father. So even if one copy of your gene is faulty, you have a backup copy that can normally function and take over and, and, and you know, make everything normal again. However, there are some what we call gain of function mutations where just having one abnormal copy is enough to give you a disease. So an example is LARC2, which is actually a gain of function. It's actually a, a mutation that changes how this gene functions and you only need one copy. So take a little break here. Um, now we're going to move on to specific genes that we know about, and these are, I'm going to focus on sort of the most common and, uh, in my mind, most important uh, mutations that we know about, because these are the mutations that are hopefully going to lead to therapies within the next 10 years. So um, first, we're going to start with GBA. 
Um, GBA is interesting in that if you have two copies of an abnormal GBA gene, then you'll get a, a much more severe disease called Gaucher's disease. Um, and and you, would, you would know if you had this disease. It's really, it's really pretty dramatic in, in terms of um, its presentation and in, in, in often presents in childhood. But, but if you have just one copy of your of mutation um, in, in one of your GBA genes, then it can dramatically increase your risk of getting Parkinson's disease. And that estimate is about 10 to 30% of people with a single copy will get the disease by the time they're 80. So it's not completely penetrant. Not everybody will get the disease, but it seems to be either a very, very strong risk factor or what we would call a monogenic disease with incomplete penetrance. So not everybody gets it, but it is definitely an, a, a risk factor. Um, this is just to show sort of where GBA mutations are found everywhere in the world. Um, so this was from um, a survey um, of, uh, of uh, Parkinson's clinics all around the world. Um, and as you can see, the majority of the mutations were found um, in areas where there were a lot of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Um, and otherwise there are still GBA mutations elsewhere in the world. Um, and um, so it doesn't, you don't have to be of Jewish descent to um, have a mutation, but um, it is, um, it is, uh, there is definitely some, some differences in terms of um, the population, um, the frequency. Um, there are therapies in development for GBA. So we are working, for example, in this, um, on this uh, particular small molecule. This is um, being uh, sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme. Um, and this is um, currently in a phase two trial um, and uh, will probably be in a phase three trial uh, starting um, next summer. Um, there are, uh, there's another uh, company, Lysosomal Therapeutics, um, which has an oral agent as well. Prevail Therapeutics actually is doing a study right now. We're not involved in that study, but they are um, in, in enrolling people in uh, New York. Um, and I think maybe Chicago, where they actually inject a viral vector that carries a normal copy of the GBA gene into the brain. Um, and so that, that would be um, obviously a more invasive uh, way of, um, of treating uh, GBA mutations. Um, and then there is a, a, a trial going on in Canada, actually, of, um, of, a, of a, a medication that has a little bit of a... Um, uh, GK chaperoning activity, um, which um, is, uh, uh, it's, um, sorry, um, the, um, the next, uh, the gene that I want to talk about um, is uh, synuclein, um, which uh, is, uh, Albert already talked about this, um, this was the, uh, fam the family pedigree of the, of the, uh, uh, that uh, enabled uh, people to first identify synuclein um, over here on the right. And as you can see, it was, it's very highly penetrant, um, where if you have one copy of the mutation, it's very, very likely you're going to get the disease. Um, synuclein um, is the gene that codes for the synuclein protein, which you've probably heard about, which is in Lewy bodies. Um, so this is the this is a Lewy body here on the bottom right, um, the little the little pink ball, um, which is inside a, a nigral neuron. Um, and the, one of the things that I find really fascinating about this gene is that if you have extra copies of the gene, so sometimes in, in addition to point mutations that we were talking about people will actually have different numbers of genes, so more than two. And if you have more than two, shown down here on the bottom left, here's a, here's a, a person who actually has four copies of the gene. Um, if you have more than two copies, it will also predispose you to getting Parkinson's. So it's as if just having more of the protein produced is enough to give you the disease. And this gets into 
that topic that Albert was talking about, where if it, there's a lot of activity and interest right now in terms of blocking either the production of synuclein using um, antisense oligonucleotides, um, which we don't really need to get into, but basically it's a way, it's, a, it's kind of a genetic treatment that you can prevent the gene from being expressed or antibodies that can bind to the protein and hopefully clear it, hopefully, hopefully get rid of it. Um, so, so both of those um, types of treatments are in trials right now. Um, and, and they may be relevant to sporadic Parkinson's as well as people who have these types of synuclein mutations. Um, LARC2 mutations are um, the second most common uh, mutations after GBA. Um, these are also um, predominantly seen in people of Ashkenazi descent. Um, and the, the, there seems to be a founder effect around the, the Mediterranean, the North African area. Um, so people who have Parkinson's um, and are from North Africa or, or um, uh, the Arab uh, countries have a very high rate of LARC2 mutations. Um, and uh, there, this, this, there's one particular mutation that, that uh, is very common in the US um, that I've listed here. It's actually surprisingly high um, penetrance. Um, so it ranges from uh, 30 to, to, to 74%. Um, if you have the gene, that's the likelihood of you getting the disease. Um, there are some LARC2 inhibitors in development. This has been a little bit slower than we expected, um, just because LARC2 is so uh, widely expressed in the human body and has so many um, additional uh, activities um, that just just um, coming up with an inhibitor that doesn't have other that doesn't affect other tissues has been has been a, a little bit challenging. Um, but um, there is a Denali product, um, which um, uh, completed its, its uh, safety studies. And then uh, Biogen has an antisense oligonucleotide um, to uh, LARC2 as well, um, which is actually recruiting. We're not, we're not uh, participating in that study, but um, uh, I know that uh, they are recruiting in Chicago. Um, so, so sort of big picture, how do we turn genetic discoveries into clinical trials or into, into treatments? Um, and and this, is, this is what I call the chicken and egg problem. So, so right now, genetic testing is not broadly performed because insurance doesn't cover it. And insurance says, well, why should we pay for genetic testing? It's not going to change people's treatment. But in order to change treatment, we have to do clinical trials and we have to prove that these therapies are effective. And in order to do those trials, we have to be able to identify people who have these genetic mutations. So this, is, this gets back to the original problem. How do we identify people who have genetic forms of Parkinson's? And this is where the, well, so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna stop here and do um, poll question number one. So if you wouldn't mind just um, filling out the, the question, if you've had any genetic testing yourself um, and what type of genetic testing you've had. And Okay, so 75% of people have not had any genetic testing. 11% have done direct to consumer testing like 23andMe. 8% um, uh, did uh, it for clinical research um, and 6% uh, did it in the clinic. Um, so that was um, presumably covered by insurance. So that's, that's I think pretty, pretty common. That's a pretty, that's a pretty um, representative number in terms of how much genetic testing has already been done. Um, I'm going to, sorry. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about these different types of genetic tests now. So, so the clinical testing, so this is where you go to your clinician and you say, you know, I'd like to get genetic testing. Maybe you have a positive family history. 
Um, and there are some uh, gene panels out there, which I would recommend, Gene DX, Centagene, Prevention, and Fulgen. I will mention that Athena, which is very dominant in the market, does not include GVA. They have a, a really small panel. Invitae also does not. Um, and the out-of-pocket costs can range from $250 to $2,000, depending on your insurance status. So this is, this is, this is sort of the problem, is, is trying to figure out like how much is this actually going to cost you. Um, research such as our collaborator, um, Clement Schertzer, who has been um, collecting a lot of DNA on a purely research basis, most research testing does not allow you to know the results because it's not CLIA approved. So it's not actually, it's not considered reliable enough that they can share the results with you. So, so that has been a, a little bit of a problem. The PD generation study is an exception to that in that the genetic testing that we're doing is CLIA approved and the results can be shared. In fact, that's sort of the whole point of the study is to give people their genetic results. The direct-to-consumer testing, such as 23andMe, um, is, is problematic, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of show you why. Interestingly, Ancestry said that they were going to be doing um, some health-related genes, but they don't include any Parkinson's genes. Um, this is what 23andMe um, tests. So, so we talked about LARC2 and GBA. These are some images of the common mutations in those genes. So every, every one of these little, um, every one of these little marks here, every, every, every annotation here um, is, is, a, is a mutation that's been identified. Um, as you can see, 23andMe only tests for three of the mutations. So one in LARC2 and two in GBA. Um, interestingly, one of the GBA mutations they test for is not considered a high risk mutation for Parkinson's. So anyway, so the problem is that when 23andMe comes back to you and says, you're not at high risk for Parkinson's, you didn't have any mutations, it's because they've done just these three mutations and it's not comprehensive. And we ourselves have seen patients who have had a 23andMe result that was negative. And then when we do the full sequencing of either LARC2 or GBA, we do in fact find out that they have a mutation. Um, so this, this is a, a survey that we did um, of um, Parkinson's providers uh, around the country, um, 200 something Parkinson's study group um, experts um, and, and we were asking, you know, why don't people get Parkinson's um, genetic testing? This was what people said. Um, they thought, well, number one, insurance doesn't pay and patients can't afford. But number two, a lot of people are under the impression that patients don't want to have genetic testing, that they're, you know, concerned about their privacy and things like that. So, so that's sort of interesting because I think the... Um, this is poll question number two. Would you personally be interested in genetic testing? And I'm just gonna wait for um, the, the results of that poll to pop up. So 72% of people would be interested in genetic testing. Um, 20% uh, said depends on cost and 10% uh, were not interested at all. Um, and I think that's, that's really very helpful because the, the, that 70% uh, percent who had not had genetic testing um, before uh, looks like a very large number would be interested in undergoing genetic testing. Um, so the next step, um, we're talking about the PD generation study in particular. Um, we mentioned uh, that we have um, been enrolling here at MGH, um, and um, in fact, we're up to um, close to a uh, close to a hundred patients actually already 
Um, and, uh, and, and we are still enrolling. Um, the, the beauty of um, this study actually is that you can do it from home. You don't have to go to the hospital. You don't have to go to the clinic. What we do is we actually send you a cheek swab, a, a, a little, a little Q-tip um, that you'll use um, to, um, to, to take some, some cells from the inside of your cheek. And then you ship that um, to be sequenced, and then we'll give you the results at, in about a month. Um, so this is this is sponsored by the Parkinson's Foundation. It's rolling out nationwide. Um, they're hoping to expand it to 50 sites and 15,000 people across the country. Um, it's uh, it's uh, depending on sort of the the funding. Um, but this is this is pretty exciting, and it's it's it's, it's certainly the largest um, uh, direct sequencing study um, that we have. Um, this is actually the results of the uh, the first uh, 291 patients who were enrolled in that study. Um, so as you can see, uh, almost 10% had GBA mutations, almost 10% had LARC2 mutations. Actually, there were a few people who had both. Um, and then uh, there was Parkin um, and rare synuclein mutations. Um, so this is so this is I think a, you know a pretty good representative uh, sample of of what um, we're expecting to see nationwide. Um, and uh, the the uh, contact information if you're interested in enrolling this is this is on their website the Parkinson's Foundation website. Um, there is a, a general. Um, email that you can send for questions. Um, we are enrolling uh, at MGH, um, and so you'll you'll probably be if you're in the New England area, you'll probably be um, sent to us um, if you sign up. Um, and I think that's it. I'm going to pause now and uh, take any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Wills. And I will ask Dr. Hung to join us again. I want to thank you both for this fantastic presentation. We have got a lot of wonderful questions from our web audience and also just being mindful of time. For those of you who are able to stay with us, we'll be here for a little bit answering Q&A. Again, you submitted some really wonderful questions. If we don't get around to your question, please do consider calling our helpline. It's staffed by Parkinson specialists. You can give them a buzz at one 800 for PD info. Uh, and for those of you who are able to join us for this Q&A session, uh, let's start off with, of course, on everyone's mind, how close are we to a cure for Parkinson's? If we can create a vaccine for COVID-19 in less than a year, why can't we find a method to stop the generation of Lewy bodies? Um, I, I'll mention, uh, it's actually interesting. There is a vaccine for synuclein that's in development. Um, so, uh, sort of getting back to that that uh, that immunotherapy for uh, anti anti synuclein, um, it's this is challenging, right? The the the, the um, genetic therapies that I was mentioning um, are I'm I'm very optimistic about them and that we'll have a, an effective uh, therapy in in the next ten years. However, the it looks like it's going to be mostly for people who have these particular mutations. And, and I'm not sure that it's not, it's going to be um, translatable to, to sort of the majority of, of people with Parkinson's where we don't know the underlying cause. Um, Albert, what do you think? I think it's a challenging question. And I think that, you know, um, for the same reasons that um, Anne-Marie mentioned, I think that there are challenges, but I think that there are hopes. I think that we have a lot of different angles to try to uh, attack Parkinson's disease, but the inherent nature of Parkinson's, the way that it progresses so slowly, the way that for each person, there's their different sets of causes, I think it's what's made it challenging. I think I would agree that um, where we really know what drives the disease process in these genetic cases is going to be more tractable than um, people who don't have a genetic cause, because I think there we, if we don't really know what's, um, what's, started the Parkinson's, it makes it harder to stop. Great, thank you both. Another question from our web audience, how long does it typically take to get from phase one to phase three, say, of a clinical trial? 
Yeah, it depends on the on the the particular um, intervention. I mean, the, the the COVID vaccine has been, as you know, just so much faster than than any other therapy. Um, if you think about like HIV, that that took ten years um, to get from you know identifying you know the virus until we until we actually had you know effective um, uh, antiviral medications. Um, so that's that's sort of a more typical uh, time frame, um, and a lot of it sort of depends on. I mean, the the challenge with these types of genetic therapies is recruitment, right? Because because it's a, it's a it's a sort of rare subset of people who have Parkinson's will know about their their genetic status and um, and be able to enroll in these types of studies, and so that's kind of the rate limiting step. Um, is being able to, to, to enroll people in the studies to, to document that there is a, there's a difference. Um, and that's, that's really where the, the like PD generation is trying to kind of bridge that, that gap um, and speed up the process. So um, I, I do think that, that you know, we, are, we are kind of at a, at a tipping point. I'm kind of excited about this as a, as, as a new way of, of, of aggressively you know, targeting Parkinson's. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I would say that, you know, in terms of this um, development from phase one to phase three, again, it depends a lot on what the goal is of the treatment. I think that when we are trying to find neuroprotective or disease modifying treatments, those inherently are going to take longer because you have to follow people for longer periods of time in order to be able to see a difference. When we're talking about new treatments that might improve symptoms, then the development time is much quicker because a person may only need to be on a symptomatic treatment for a period of three months or six months to be able to determine if there's a difference. So I think it uh, really depends a, a lot on the nature of what the treatment is trying to address. And you know, as, as Dr. Will said, the, the, the particular condition that we're trying to treat. Great, thank you. I have a question um, about being able to take drugs that your doctor prescribed. Is it possible to be in a research study while taking those drugs that are prescribed to you? I can address that one. You know, I think that each study has specific inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, the studies are designed in a way to really try and optimize the likelihood that we're going to be able to see an effect. So some um, treatment, uh, some dr uh, trials especially those that are focused on disease modification, may require that you not be on any medication because those medications treat your symptoms and they'll confound the interpretation of your response. Uh, but there are many other treatment trials where um, there may be some restrictions, certain dose of levodopa, certain amount of time you've been on medications, but each, um, each one is trial specific. Great, thank you. Is there any benefit to postponing levodopa therapy until you really need it? I, I, can, I can take a stab at that one. So, you know, levodopa is symptomatic treatment. So when I would say the, what I usually recommend to my patients is if you feel like your symptoms are interfering with your quality of life and how you do things, I think it's very reasonable to start levodopa or another form of dopamine replacement. Uh, you know, the, the term needing it is, I think, a little bit subjective. I think you don't want to wait until you're really struggling to start treatment if starting that medication would make a big difference now. Uh, because this talk is about research, it's also good to think about uh, with your doctors, if you do start levodopa, in some cases, you would not qualify for a research study. So it's important to think about that uh, with your neurologist before you um, fill your prescription. Great, thank you so much. Is there any research being done on the gut and microbiome effects in Parkinson's disease? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, sequencing that's being done of uh, the microbiome. Um, there are certainly differences in terms of PD gut um, flora, um, but it's still not clear what's chicken and egg. Um, it's not clear if the, the changes in the motility of the gut lead to differences in the, in the flora. 
um, also if levodopa and all the Parkinson's medications are changing the, the, the flora. Um, so nobody has yet sort of done a, a trial where they've been able to either cause Parkinson's by giving, you know, abnormal gut flora or uh, reverse or stop Parkinson's by changing the gut flora. I think it's an interesting question. There is some um, data to suggest that uh, treating bacterial small bowel overgrowth and uh, Helicobacter pylori um, can uh, improve uh, the absorption of levodopa um, in some cases. Um, but uh, the, but but yeah. So the so you know like the idea of doing like a stool transplant, a fecal transplant um, that has not happened um, in, in Parkinson's yet. Great, thank you. Another question we had come in is, I had originally thought that research stated that Parkinson's was more of an environmental issue with less of a genetic involvement. Is that still the case? So it's a mix, it's a mix of both. Um, over the years, you know, things have sort of flip-flopped back and forth in terms of, you know, what people think are, are most important. Um, it's, it's definitely, it, it, we think it is a combination that probably if you have a genetic risk, if you have some of these mutations, then a combination with a, a second hit with an environmental um, exposure is probably enough to push you into having the disease. Um, so, so it, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's what, it sort of depends on sort of where the most recent research has been. And, and, and recently the most recent research has been in, in genetics. Great, thank you. Do you know of any specific studies or have any advice for direct family members? My mother and my dad's twin brother are both diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So this is this is an interesting um, question, and actually we're we're planning on on putting together a survey um, for people to to see how much interest there would be um, among family members. Right now, we are not enrolling family members or unaffected people into PD generation. Um, we are curious, though, to know sort of how many family members of, of people who who have, um, especially have an identified gene, um, would be interested in, in getting tested. I do know that, um, for example, people are sending their DNA to 23andMe, and 23andMe has actually put together a, a study um, with the University of Rochester where they um, uh, reach out to people who have LARC2 mutations from known mutations from the 23andMe, um, sequencing and, and often those are just healthy people who have no idea, no risk factors, no um, no sign of the disease, um, and asking them if they would like to participate in an observational study where they're being just followed over time and seeing if they develop the signs of Parkinson's. So that is something that um, you could do if you were interested in. Um, I am a little bit worried. I have to mention there are some privacy issues with 23andMe. Um, as you may know, they have um, their their they are have um, some agreements um, with pharmaceuticals in terms of um, selling data, and it's not necessarily identifiable data. But there's there's always this. Um, I am I am nervous about encouraging people to 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 get tested through um, 23andMe for that reason. So. Um, but we are. This is this is a, an area of particular interest. I think I think you know this is sort of the next frontier would be to identify people who have genes that are at high risk of Parkinson's and trying to do interventions to prevent them from getting the disease in the future. Great, thank you. And we will take two more uh, quick questions here. Again, I wanna note we had some fantastic questions come in from our web audience. If we did not get around to your question, please do call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. Our next question is, what qualifies someone to participate in PD generation? Um, so there's there's no um, absolute uh, cut, you know, criteria. Um, the the it, you, you do have to have Parkinson's disease um, and you have to be able to consent and participate in research. Um, we are uh, encouraging people who have a family history 
um, to participate, um, but you don't have to have one. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, there is the, the website has a portal where you can log in um, and find your closest site. Um, if you are in the New England area, it is probably us um, at MGH, but, um, but it's, it's, as I mentioned, it is nationwide and um, you can um, enroll uh, pretty much from anywhere um, in the country at this point. Great, thank you. And our last question uh, for Dr. Hong is, how has COVID-19 impacted future Parkinson's trials? Do you think most will have an at-home component ongoing? Uh, it's a great question. And I think it's a lot, uh, it's a question that many uh, sponsors of research studies are thinking about. You know, I think that um, a lot will depend on the nature of the study. I think that some assessments are more conducive to remote um, evaluations, others are harder. And, um, you know, it's a really important question, not only for research, but for clinical care. You know, when we, when we get thrown curveballs like COVID, how are we gonna to respond to it? And I think that's a really important question for the Parkinson's community, because we realize that when people are um, having to quarantine, stay at home, it's harder to get clinical care, it's harder to access studies, people are more reluctant to participate in a research study where they have to come in uh, on a weekly or monthly basis. So um, COVID is having an impact on research just like it has on every other aspect of our life. So I think that uh, most um, uh, coordinating groups that are, are organizing and sponsoring trials are trying to think of ways to transmit, uh, transfer some of that to a remote basis. Some like PD generation, it's, it's very straightforward to do that. Others that involve treatment are more challenging. Awesome, thank you both so, so much. I appreciate your taking the extra time to answer these fantastic questions we received through our web audience. And again, I thank you for your presentations. This was a wonderful uh, way to engage our Parkinson's community in New England, get our folks interested in research and hopefully reach out soon and, and join a trial. So thank you both Dr. Hung and Dr. Wills for joining us today. Um, again, if your question was not answered, please do call our helpline. We have our great Parkinson specialist. My colleagues are there to help you at 1-800-4PD-INFO. And for more information about resources or upcoming virtual events, visit our website at parkinson.org or for a local touch, visit parkinson.org slash New England. This program was recorded and will be soon archived on our YouTube channel at parkinson.org slash YouTube. Another round of applause and thank you to today's sponsors. You can learn more about our sponsors by visiting our virtual exhibit hall at parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter dash supporters. And last but not least, we hope you'll come back soon. Our next virtual New England program is coming right up on Thursday, December 10th for Beyond the Diagnosis, Managing Changing Symptoms with Dr. Christine Kim of Yale. You can learn more and register at parkinson.org slash beyond dash CT. And then next up in PD Health at Home on Wednesday, December 9th, we'll be discussing vertigo and dizziness in Parkinson's. For a complete lineup of our PD Health at Home virtual programs, feel free to visit parkinson.org slash PD Health. And that just about wraps us up, folks. In the coming days, you'll be receiving a short survey. We hope you'll take a minute to complete it and we'd love to get your feedback on this program and hear of other topics you'd like to learn about. On behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, thank you again for joining us, Dr. Hung, Dr. Wills, MGH. Uh, be well and come back soon. Bye everyone.